Hey, good morning. I am going to be talking to Abigail Favali, Dr. Favali, who is at Notre Dame right now. And the reason that I asked her to come talk with me is because I've been really interested in women and how we understand women. This is an important conversation, I think, to have both within the church and outside of the church. Um, I was talking with Dana Joya a few weeks ago, and I was explaining to him that this is an interest of mine. And he said, women have always been twice rebels, which I find a fascinating phrase. He said, within the church, you have men wanting to silence their voice for all sorts of reasons. And then outside of the church, you have people wanting to erase who they are. And so how do you rebel against both fronts and find your identity in Christ and know what a woman is? And so I've been reading a lot of books about this. And one of the ones I picked up was Her Land, which is a 1915 novel that we're going to talk about today. And I thought, who better to help me understand this novel than the author of The Genesis of Gender? So thanks for making the time, Abby. Do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself to anybody who doesn't know you? Sure. So like you mentioned, um, I, as of this month, now work at the University of Notre Dame. I am a professor in the McGrath Institute for Church Life. I just published The Genesis of Gender. I have a long-standing interest slash obsession about women and gender and all this kind of stuff. So everything you were saying, I was like, yes. Um, I'm just really interested in women's stories, um, especially women who kind of don't always fit the norm. Mm -hmm. um, so I love that we're talking about Herland today. Um, I've taught this novel multiple times, but it's been a few years since I've read it. So I'm I'm going from memory here because most of my books are still boxed up, but yeah. um, I'm still excited to talk about it. Do you know what uh, G.K. Chesterton says about how you remember books? I don't know if you've heard this. Mm -mm. Okay. He, um, when he wrote on Charles Dickens, he got a lot of quotes wrong. And so there were a bunch of scholars that were like, oh, that didn't actually happen the way you wrote about it. And that quote is incorrect. And he's like, well, I digested the text so well that of course it's going to come out differently. Yeah. I, just, I, mean, I love great. that metaphor. But I mean, I think that's the reality with text. They become so much a part of the person who read them that they do change and morph, you know, um, like, for example, like your memoir, the way that I summarize it to people is going to sound nothing like the story, how you mm -hmm. probably remember it. Whenever I'm trying to say like, this is why you should read the Genesis of gender. I say, okay, Abigail Favali grew up evangelical, went to a Christian college, became an atheist, went to a gender women's studies program for her master's, became a Christian again. <laughs> <laughs> right. And so now she has this interesting perspective and that's like such a summation, but I think it's a really clear way of just trying to get your story across, like why you are the person at this time to help us understand these big questions. Yeah. Yeah. I do have a, a wayward journey, <laughs> um, through with feminism and Christianity. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, you mentioned in my memoir, I do have a conversion memoir that kind of traces my journey from evangelicalism to postmodern feminism and now to Catholicism. Um, so I'm, I still am so interested in gender and women's issues. Um, and I like to think about them now as a Catholic. Um, yeah. So, so did you come to Herland for the first time? Like, did you read it first as a Christian evangelical as someone in a women's studies program or as someone who is a Catholic? You know, I'm trying to remember when I first read it. So I don't think I read it until I was already a lit professor. So I would, that would have been probably still in my postmodern pseudo Christian phase, <laughs> like angsty post evangelical mm -hmm. feminist mm -hmm. lit professor stage because, um, so yeah, Charlotte Perkins Gilman has this oft anthologized short story, the yellow wallpaper, right. Which is fun to teach. Yeah. And so that was kind of a staple in a lot of my gen ed lit classes. Um, and then I, I was, I think it was when I was prepping a, um, women's lit course for the first time. I think that's the first time I read it. Um, and I was just looking at more of her work, right. Cause the yellow wallpaper is so famous, but then she has this whole collection of short stories. She has essays. And then I was like, what is this her land? You know, this, yeah. I love kind of utopia slash dystopia, mm -hmm. um, kind of literature. And I found it to be very helpful in spurring discussion about what you know about gender about social constructed so social constructionist views of gender and essentialist views of gender and how those play out in what um Gilman is doing in the novel and it's just a fun thought experiment too that's these um 
these kind of utopian novels. I don't know. There's something really fun, fun about them. So um, I think that was the first time I read it as as a feminist professor. When I first came across it, it was because there was actually a news story recently in which there was another utopian novel and all the men get taken off of Earth. Have you heard about this? Mm-hmm. It was 2022. So there was this, yeah, so they were writing about, and I, I thought it sounded fascinating, like all the men get taken away, but it was already censored by a, like a bunch of booksellers because they wouldn't sell it because the trans men still get taken away. So it, it's anybody with an XY chromosome. So like, even if you're identified oh, as, a, as a woman, is that, so you just say trans woman or trans, I don't know if I got that right. I don't want to. Yeah. So no, I think. So you mean, yeah. So I, if, so, if you need to make, if you need to keep track of sex, yeah, yeah. <laughs> sounds like you do in this, yeah. in this, in this instance, like a, so trans identifying male. Yes. Right. Is that what you're trying yeah. to say? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And so, so it's transphobic that that's why it was banned. What's it called? I'm so yeah. fascinated well, now. now. Yeah. Yeah. I wish I could remember, but you, you can probably Google because yeah, all it. of this, you know, yeah, and I'll have to find it too. So I can like add it to the YouTube video, but like there was all this, you know, crazy stuff about it that it just, it was problematic. And I thought that's so interesting. And the guy who was reviewing it and saying that it should be embraced and not banned was like, we have forerunners of this, including Herland by, by Gilman. And I only mm-hmm. knew Gilman from the yellow wallpaper. So I was like, she wrote a satire mm-hmm. utopia like this. And I remember I was telling my dad that I was reading this and he's like, well, that's not the answer to the problem to like clear the men out and only leave the women. So <laughs> it might be worth starting a conversation with like, why does Gilman write a satirical utopia? Like, how is that, you know, the genre of the book being a utopia, not where she's like outlining a program necessarily for the future? Right. I mean, there's so many ways in which this could not work, right? So clearly the whole parthenogenesis thing, right? Like, so she's got to figure out, okay, I want to write about an all female society, but then how does it continue to exist past the first generation, right? So, you know, there's some sci-fi kind of um, action there with women being able to spontaneously reproduce. Um, so there's no danger of this being, I mean, the closest analog would be like, you know, the separatist lesbian feminists yeah, um, of second wave or something. But um, she's not offering this as a program. Um, rather, I think what she's doing is she's trying to show I think she's trying to explore what would women look like in a natural environment. So in a social context where the I, the concept of womanhood is not totally filtered um, through what men want and what men think women should be. So I think it was, again, I think it's a thought experiment, you know, to, and it's pretty fantastical, but I think she's, she's using it to critique, um, especially the, the norms, I think the gender norms and stereotypes of her time, um, and to show how women when freed from those can develop into more fully formed, um, and very virtuous human beings. So I think she's trying to make the case that the gender norms of her time were like deforming women basically and shackling them from becoming um, fully human in a way. It reminds me in that sense of things like um, Dostoevsky's dream of a ridiculous man, right? Where he enters this utopia where sin, like the fall hasn't happened or the Lord of the Flies is the opposite. If you leave children alone on an island, they're all going to become violent because we're actually just horrible, nasty, brutish, short, et cetera. Um, So in this context, so you have this world, I'll just summarize it quickly. You have this land high up in the mountains in which for 2000 years, the women have just, they were left alone. All the men were destroyed and they were able to just reproduce by virgin births. And now three male explorers come into their midst and they want to hear about the outside world and like what they've missed by having only one sex rather than having two sexes um, in their society, right? So what is it that she's highlighting are both the problems with the way that gender is conceived in 1915, mostly through an American perspective, whereas the women once freed from that, what do they become? What ultimately becomes kind of the state, the natural state of woman? 
Mm-hmm. Right. Yep. I think you're, I think you're right. So, you know, it reminds me, well, in different, in a different way, but it reminds me actually of book five of Plato's Republic when he tries to also, you know, when he actually is kind of painting this ideal society and trying to um, wrestle with the idea of how new, new beings come into being, right? So how do we deal with, how, how do we make sure that, anyway, he comes up with this very, I find it very dystopian, although I think he thinks it's a fabulous idea, right? Way of um, dealing with human reproduction among the kind of philosopher kings. And there's this weird kind of like marriage mating thing by lottery. And then the the most dystopian part to me is that the children are then kind of raised by these sort of like state run kind of daycares. I don't know. I mean, it's basically like he he finds child rearing to be like the most troublesome thing that you kind of have to just like, oh, like deal with it somehow. But um, he very much also makes this effort to, I guess, um, denaturalize the family or to take the family unit out because you can't really, I mean, he's kind of saying you can't have this unified society um, with, without, if you still are dependent upon these family units, right? And so there's something interesting about Herland because unlike Plato, child rearing is seen as like the highest art. It's like the most important work. Um, and education, the education of children. Um, but it's also the responsibility of the community. So it seems like, from what I remember, the the like mother-child bond is um, is not really prioritized, right? But rather, everyone mothers every child, right? So there's more of this kind of communal. There's they don't have a word for family. Um, they also don't have a word for patriotism, you know, things like that. So it's really, so that, but that kind of getting rid of the family in order to have this kind of utopian collaborative culture reminds me of um, the Republic. Yeah. And women get their babies for two to three years, which, you know, when I was living in the Czech Republic, they have maternity leave for two to three years. That's amazing. So you get two to three years, but then it is also similar to her land in the sense that, but then you turn your kids over to the state and there's like all day education the way there is, you know, also in France, like it's all day and the state is running it because they know what's best for your kid. And in her land, it's the men explorers that find this really problematic because they want the education to stay within the home, that the mother would be in charge of educating the kids. And yet Gilman seems to suggest that like, if it was all run by women, a state education would be great. (laughs) Right. Which is why, I mean, so one thing, so here's kind of a question I have. um, I'm curious what you think. Is she trying to say that without men, women are just really good? (laughs) Like they're super smart. They're really virtuous. And you know, they, they form this right utopian society. That's very peaceful. There's no war. Everyone's happy, fulfilled. Mm -hmm. Or is she saying that, you know, more the kind of the, the gender norms of the culture, um, are kind of inhibiting both men and women. Does that make sense? But rather if we had, cause that's, that's something I'm trying to figure out, I guess this is a question I would ask my students. Like, is she giving a social constructionist understanding better, or is she is she also which she's certainly doing because she's critiquing mm-hmm. social norms but is she also offering this kind of essentialist and very romanticized view of what women are like yeah. now in a natural state because i'm like i don't know yeah i don't know that i would be super peaceful like i i'm kind of a choleric you know have mm-hmm. a temperament right so mm-hmm. um yeah i don't know what do you think about that do you think she's idealizing women too much? I I think it's a good book because it doesn't lean one way or the other all the way. This is one of the reasons I like it. So for example, when the three explorers, Terry, Jeff, and Van are all courting the three women that they're going to be paired up with, right? To see what a bisexual society looks like. And by bisexual, they just mean two sexes, right? Mm -hmm. Um, What would this look like? So Terry is your John Wayne character, Jeff is your Clark Gable character, and then, or Rhett Butler, or whatever you want to have it. And then Van is 
probably a lot like our husbands, like, oh, women are human, <laughs> right? They're human beings with both pros and cons and all the things that go with that complexity. And Van gets offended because his partner he's being set up with says, you remind me of a woman. And what she means by that is you seem to be human. You seem to be the most human among us. So there, there is a sense in this utopia that without the violence of the, the male, right? So that's the way she's viewing it is that men are violent and competitive via Terry or without the romantic idealization of women via Jeff, women are just able to function as human. So it seems like she has an idea, not just of women being that way, but that human beings, if they didn't have competition, if they didn't have to have patriotism, because there are no other countries that are causing friction either. So it's not just a gender thing, but it's this idea of like competing against another. So even in their society, right, it's all one color. And it's like this mix of like tan beigeness, if you remember, right? So that it's all one color. It's all one language. It's all one gender. There's no other countries. It's one country. They're one religion. Yeah. So it's it's not necessarily just a gender argument she's making, but if you don't have friction with anything that you can call other, we would be perfect. But that yeah. means we would have to be all one government, one religion, one gender, et cetera. But do, do you think though that she's, and this is this, since you've read it more recently than I have, do you think though that she does link violence more to men than to women yeah and and you feel that from the very beginning because terry gets there and he's like terry <laughs> terry <laughs> sorry i don't know if i can say that so yeah the men are actually really funny in this like they're these archetypes like you described like okay. jeff he is the he's like this southern gentleman he's really sensitive and shiv you know all mm -hmm. the like chival chivalric i don't know right chival. yeah yeah chivalric yeah. there you go yeah and terry is just like this like frat bro mm -hmm. you know kind of man's man and then van is this like you know like cool-headed kind of scientific socialist you know. yes yes, right? yes so um yeah that makes for some interesting yeah yeah, she doesn't um, allow them in a lot of complexity. Like there, and there is no dynamism to their characters. Like there's no sense, and that's why it's a utopia. It's a satire. It's right, not right. But the other are flat characters. Yeah, yeah, there's not meant to have that kind of complexity. But from the very beginning, you get this foreshadowing that like Terry is going to cause violence in this community. But that happens in every single utopia, right? I mean, you have Gulliver's Travels, and he his friction with the other characters is what causes problems. Or Dostoevsky's Dream of a Ridiculous Man. Another man comes in there. And the once perfect world becomes fallen. So you always have to have, I think, that grid of sand that is dropped into the utopia that causes the friction and shows their weaknesses. And one of their weaknesses is they don't know how to handle sin, right? They exile or they, um, what's the word? Not censor. They neuter. What would be the word? Sterilize. They sterilize any woman who shows weaknesses. Yeah. Mm. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. You see the weakness in that society. If you're trying to keep everything the same, right, that also becomes problematic. But that's also why, why I found that fascinating, because in our culture, any woman that differentiates from what women or men think a woman should be, we try to cut away that part of her. I mean, don't you think that that's, that's what this book also might be suggesting, even if maybe Gilman didn't mean to, is that she's showing that that tendency where you don't have flexibility or room for women to be different causes a problem with our understanding of women? Yes. I mean, I, I definitely agree with your, um, with your point right there. What I'm wondering is, because I'm wondering if Gilman has much of a sense of differences among women though because the women also all kind of seem the same yeah. right like they you know like you're I mean aside from the ones that they like quietly right. you know like awesome. neuter in exile right but the ones that they keep you know so I'm um I'm wondering then if there's if there is a sense in which they they also have very carefully policed norms around how one should act, but it does seem to be just based more in the idea of virtue, you know, almost mm -hmm. in this, like, you know, being, being virtuous, mm -hmm. um, and valuing the community. And so if there's a danger to the community or disrupting the community, then that's when the individual has to kind of 
kind of be erased in a way. I don't know, or exiled. So yeah, there's something Stepford yeah. wives ish about the Yeah, except that they're like they're not Stepford wives ish because yeah. they're they wear like very practical clothes and they're kind mm-hmm. of buff and they've got short hair. So they're um you know they it's funny, like while the men are there, their hair grow long. So she does this kind of playful reversing of certain gender stereotypes, like the women in her land, you know, have, they try to balance, it seems like what is practical with also having a sense of what is beautiful, but Mm -hmm. there's not this sense of like feminine adornment at all, because like they're working, they're growing the food, you know, they're very physically active. They're very physically strong. Um, so that's another kind of reversal The the women are in some cases, um, they're more agile than the men. They're fast. They're great at climbing trees. I think I remember that correctly, yeah, but yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No. And it's one of the things that I liked about the book, because I think it gives a freedom to, to reconceive of a woman, especially if you imagine this is written in 1915 mm-hmm. and men are, you know, still carrying women's baskets. Like it talks about in the book, like, you know, Terry tries to carry the basket of one of the ladies because we love you so much. We idolize you. We take care of you. You don't right. have to carry your basket. And yet we keep you at home and we, <laughs> right. And they, the women in her land are like, like in prison, what does she do there? Right. She doesn't have the opportunity to work. So these women are idealized, you know, by the men in their own communities, they work, but you can't be too ambitious with your work, right? There's, you have to still find your place in the system. Well, the work is very, I mean, it's kind of an agrarian culture, right? So the work in her land is not work in this kind of capitalist sense of like being totally separate from the domestic sphere. It's mm-hmm. like, you know, the the education that happens and, you know, growing food, preparing food, like all this, it's, it's a much more kind of holistic society in that way. Like there isn't this um, alienation from their labor. Yeah. Um, so even though the women work, that work is not separate and opposed to the rearing of children, mm-hmm. the, you know, like you know, making food and um, all of it's kind of integrated, it seems like. And they consider it all work. Like it's not like, oh, anything I'm doing that's not directly related to children mm-hmm. or the domestic sphere isn't work. I think, isn't there a place where they're, where they're, they kind of, are confused that the men don't consider domestic labor to be work. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So there's this, they're like, why do you, be, well, why do you think in this way that there's like, like there's work, which is always outside the home. Mm-hmm. Um, how, okay. I can't remember. How do they live? Like if they don't have households, is it like, yeah, it's like I dorms. Can't... Okay. So even when they get married, they still have dorms that are shared, like shared bathroom dorms. So the three women, the three, there are like three women who end up getting married, but of the course there isn't people. marriage in the society prior right. to the men being there. Right. And then they have to like make up a ceremony and put them each in different rooms, but they don't know what marriage is. And none of the women want to participate in intercourse because it's not right. time to make children yet. <laughs> and they don't understand why you would have intercourse without desiring to be a father. Right. And that's what leads to the whole problem with Terry. And yes. Why? Right. Um, yes. Because he owns her. And what's so fascinating, too, is even mm. the level headed Van, when Terry tries to rape his own wife, Van is like, well, he is allowed to do that. In our mm-hmm. society, that's not a problem. In 1915, it's, it's a really good reminder that, like, well, like, even in their society, it's not assault if it's your wife because you own her. Yeah. I mean, I think we still, I mean, obviously not in the legal sense, but I think. Mm-hmm that idea is not totally, you know, I mean, even in sometimes, especially in Christian circles, like the conversation about the marital debt, it can kind of take a little dark turn sometimes. Like you owe it, you know, like, right. right. Um, yeah. Well, I, okay. So I, I find one, maybe one of the most fascinating things about her land and why I do think it's really useful to teach it, read it. It's fun, but also because it's a, it's a feminist, I mean, and Gilman is explicitly a feminist, right? So she's a first wave feminist. So it is this feminist critique, this kind of feminist take, but at the same time, it's pre second wave feminism. And so there is 
still this sense that what a woman is, is grounded in her ability to become a mother. Like that's what a woman is. Like that's, that's the, the ground of womanhood. It's not these, you know, stereotypes. It's not these kind of cultural, um, you know, expressions of that. It's like a woman is the kind of human being that has the capacity to gestate and become a mother. Um, and, and then the, the fact that sex is still seen as connected to procreation. And so even in her like parthenogenesis kind of world, being a woman is still connected to a particular procreative role. Um, and whereas I think after this era, once we embrace contraception as a culture, once feminism becomes really embroiled in, a, in kind of the pro-abortion, like that perspective, like the attitude toward motherhood changes drastically and within feminist thought. And so I find that fascinating too, that she's, you know, she's pretty explicitly a feminist, but then she's also, you know, very positive about motherhood. Um, so it seems to take that, that like woman is very much grounded in femaleness, but not necessarily quote unquote, like cultural femininity. No. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to bring it up with you because that's what your book kept suggesting mm -hmm. is that the potential to be mother is how we would define what a woman is. Right. Mm -hmm. And so you even mentioned, like, even if you had a hysterectomy, the fact that you can have a hysterectomy is what makes you a woman, right? Your potential to have been a mother, to be a mother is still there. Like that potential. Exactly. Is like, yeah. Even if the yeah. potential is never actualized or can't be actualized, right? Like a man, a man who can't get pregnant isn't called infertile because he doesn't have that potential to begin with. Right. So, um, that, I think that's the only coherent ground for, you know, to answer this question, like, what is a, what is a woman, or at least, you know, that's the starting point, I think. Um, well, and so I like that. I like that Gilman is in kind of this era where that's still taken for granted. Like that reality is still respected. It's almost obvious. It's like, well, of course, like, well, what a woman is, is the kind of human being that can, you know, create life within her as opposed to the kind of human being who can create life outside of himself. You know, it's, it's just, yeah. that's the way it is. Well, and Edith Stein talks about, right. Even if you don't become a biological mother, that that potency for motherhood is part of the embodied soulness of whom women are. Mm -hmm. And the way that they uplifted motherhood, like in the text seemed to suggest, I mean, it has this transcendent element to it, right? Um, to be a mom can be more than just having biological children. Yes. I don't yeah. Know it's almost like their that. religion in a way, <laughs> like it, you know, it almost goes like maybe too far in the other direction, yeah, but it's so, yeah. it's such a contrast to me though, with like the, from later feminist, um, kind of writers who, who really begin to see, I mean, you see this in Simone de Beauvoir, you know, who's writing in 1949, mm -hmm. you know, so just a few decades later, she, you know, she very much sees that women's capacities to become mother yeah. enslaves them to the species, like women are enslaved to the species, like naturally. So that, that, that view of pregnancy, um, and the capacity for motherhood as being this, this shackle, this mm -hmm. huge, like burden that women have to like escape from in order to be free is such a different perspective than the early feminists. Yeah. Well, and I know one of the other reasons I wanted to talk to you about your book in conjunction with Herland was exactly that. In Simone de Beauvoir, you point out how in order to be the best possible woman, you basically have to become a man, right? Like yeah. you have to like cut off the ability to nurse. So remove the breast. You have to remove the uterus because it's going to hold you back. And in her land, you don't have that. You have the best way to be a woman is to be one who gives birth and nurses. And there's this fullness, but that doesn't, that doesn't take away your ability to work. And this is one of the things that I, I feel like I'm constantly rebelling against the way I grew up when it comes to being a woman is all of the way that I could fulfill God's calling for my life was in the home, like all of it. And in her land, that's not what you have. Yes. Like motherhood is uplifted. It is transcendent. It is highly exalted. And yet they watch education wise, you know, do you have a proclivity to be a teacher? Do you have a proclivity to be a Mason? Do you have a proclivity right to work in the temple? what are the ways in which you have been designed? And this is a very, it, there's no Christianity, but there's still an understanding of vocation that I think is different than what Simone de Beauvoir would even have. 
Right. Because in, I guess in her land, those things aren't set up in opposition, right? Mm -hmm. That you have like meaningful work mm -hmm. that, in, that includes being a mother, right? Mm -hmm. These aren't, it's not like an either or proposition here. Mm -hmm. Like mothers can and should have meaningful work while also still very much fully being mothers and embracing that as something good and a gift and a priority, right? And and I do like, I like how one other helpful contrast with our society, I think, is that her land is very much set up around the the needs and um, the good of the young people rather than the the desires of adults, yes. right? Yeah. And that's pretty amazing. Like, how well, do we, create, right. you know, how do we create a society where these new people who come into existence like become these fully formed human beings? Mm -hmm. And that attention, I think, to the individual, I also find that to be very beautiful. Mm -hmm. Well, and um, even yeah. they, they plant trees that they will never in their lifetime see grow. I mean, all mm -hmm. of the attention is that my daughters will see it grow. My granddaughters will see that tree grow. And so all of their attention is to, to this longevity. Um, I will say in opposition to a Judeo-Christian perspective, though, they try to forget the past. They constantly mm -hmm. rewrite laws to kind of have a clean slate as much as possible over and over again, even though they are future focused. That would yeah. be like one of my negatives is like, how can you possibly plan well for the future if you don't have a rich understanding of the past? Mm -hmm. Right. Well, also, I think, I think one of the, one of the problems with the book, I guess, or just the thought experiment is that she, she's only able to portray this by basically getting rid of the, the need for men mm -hmm. <laughs> to have a baby. Right. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden women can like spontaneously reproduce. Mm -hmm. So it kind of raises this question then, well, how, like, that's not realistic. Like yeah. that's never going to happen. So it doesn't, it doesn't do a good job of accommodating sexual difference, yeah. right. Or showing that to be beautiful. It's mm -hmm. like motherhood's amazing. Women are awesome. But then sexual difference almost seems like, like that's the kind of bad thing that we have to overcome yeah. in a way. Yeah. And in that way, I actually see her as being this almost inverse Simone de Beauvoir, yeah. because Simone de Beauvoir's vision, her utopian vision, very much informed by Marxism and socialism, is also that there will be this peaceful collaborative society, the children, there won't be families, the children will be raised by the state, um, and then, but women have access to contraception and abortion, so they basically come like, become like men, so mm -hmm. there's still this sense that like, oh, an ideal society is one that minimizes or erases sexual difference, Yeah. Um, so or, or racial yeah. difference or class. Oh difference, yeah. Right. Like it's, it's yeah. a matter of like, if we can erase all differences versus learning to work within differences. Right. Well, but I mean, even with, yeah, I mean, even with race and class, you can, it's possible for a society to be, to exist without classes. Like not, I mean, just like hypothetically, right. That is possible. Like you could have, um, an ice, you know, and there are, there are like isolated cultures that, um, you know, don't have racial difference. They don't have class difference, but you, ha every society has, right, that's difference. true. you that's know what I mean? So yeah. it's like, like, that's just, you know, that's just written into our species. Mm -hmm. Um, and so the fact that she's kind of like, can't really accommodate it. Yeah. And that's just, you know, that's a, that's also a problem on for, uh, for other feminist thinkers, um, who, who kind of minimize sexual but I mean, the task then for us, I think, like, especially as, as Christians and, you know, as Christian feminists is to like, how do we cultivate a society where men and women are able to fully become human and to have a sense mm -hmm. of dignity while also seeing sexual difference as this gift, like this yeah. kind of final flourish of, of creation, um, rather than this, this threat to our dignity. I think part of the problem is expectations with sexual difference is that we assume whatever we grew up with, whatever we have culturally understood, that that's what a woman is or that's what a man is. And then we expect everyone else to fit that mold. Uh, and so even when the guys go over there, you know, if I can quote it just briefly, we had expected the women to be given over to feminine vanity, to frills. We found that they had evolved a costume more perfect with pockets. We had expected- Pockets! I loved the pockets. 
We had expected a dull, submissive monotony and found a social inventiveness beyond our own, right? We had expected pettiness and found social consciousness. We expected jealousy and found sisterly affection, right? So there were these expectations that were problematic based on a stereotype or a vision of what like womanhood meant rather than a full understanding of what women can be and should be, right? And so that's, I think, how we would live more with sexual differences is to celebrate the variety even within the sex. Yes. Right. And not have that kind of need to conform to one idea, um, which I think you and I don't fit. I mean, how often are you called a force? I'm called a force like all the time. <laughs> regularly, I don't know that I've ever been called a force. <laughs> I'm regularly called a force because any other man who just gets things done is just expected. Mm, I see. Well, I'm glad you haven't been called a force. <laughs> No, I mean, I kind of want to now. I'm like, well, why haven't I been called? I've been called other things. <laughs> <laughs> uh, namely, I think everyone, I don't know, that what I get called most, it's really, it kind of cracks me up, is a radical feminist because the super conservatives see me as a radical feminist just because they see every feminist as radical. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, because I've critiqued some of the like gender framework in our culture, then the progressives will see me as a trans exclusionary radical feminist. So I'm kind of like, everyone agrees I'm a radical feminist. I'm actually just like this devout Catholic, yeah. you know, with like four kids, I live in the Midwest, you know what I mean? I, I guess I'm radical if that's what it takes now, but yeah. you know, there are worse things to be called. So, well, you know, in that sense, I'm, I'm in a very similar camp. Like I am a mom of three, I'm at home with my kids and then I'm constantly hit on both sides, mostly in the classical education world. Oh yeah. Because on the conservative side, they're like, why are you changing our great books core? Why are you including right. Eastern texts? Why are you including texts by women? Why are persons lady are authors? Mm -mm. <laughs> right. Yep. Yeah. It's just this crazy thing where you're like, no. And then the liberals think like, why are you still, why are you reading great books? <laughs> you know, like, why are you including right. the men? Right. It's just, <laughs> oh, you're right. It's this ideological minefield. It's true. Yep. Yeah. And we're just kind of trying to walk through the middle, which is why I like you. We're in this place of like nuance, yeah. complexity, and I love being there. So yeah, no, that's good. That's a good, yeah. It's hard to stay there, but it's good to be there. So yeah. let's stay there together. <laughs> well, for all the people who want to stay in that middle way, um, mm -hmm. what would you recommend? So if they followed the Herland reading or after they read Genesis of Gender, where should they go? What should they read more? Ooh, that's a great question. Well, you mentioned Edith Stein. So for those who like to read more like theological, philo philosophical stuff about gender, I would recommend her essays on women. There's kind of an edited collection that pulls those together. So that's great. Um, I will also recommend the book of my heart, which you know, is Kristen Lovren's Daughter by Sigrid Unset. So it's this trilogy um, that takes place in medieval Norway, and it basically follows this woman's life. Um, but I, here's one of the reasons I love it. One, I read it at a perfect time. Um, I think, so if, let's say I, if you've tried to read it before and you were like, I can't get into this, like try again. Um, but I don't think I've ever seen, speaking of motherhood, motherhood portrayed so well in literature. And I think part of that is until fairly recently, most women writers were not also mothers, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, the ability to write about motherhood from this insider perspective. And like the way she talks about breastfeeding and lactation, that's what struck me. Cause I read it as a breastfeeding mom. And I was like, yeah. I was like, I don't think I've ever read such a compelling account of what it feels like, mm -hmm. you know, to be lactating. Like, this is so cool anyway. <laughs> so I love, I love those books. Those are wonderful. Um, so. Yeah. Well, with yeah. Kristen, the first time I read it, I was 20 ish. And I mean, I was in college, so I don't remember exact age, but I just loved the, where she fell passionately in love with her. Yeah. The first one's great. You and know, I was like, like Oh, this is so good. <laughs> and then it's like, Oh wait. Yeah. Right. <laughs> then it's like life continues past yeah. that, you know? Yeah. It's great though. Oh, it definitely, if you do try to, to read it, use the more recent um, translation by Tina Nunnally. That's another mistake I made. I tried to read it when I was younger in like the 1920s translation, which tries to do this weird, like formal kind of Englishy mm -hmm. anyway, but it doesn't, it's not very readable. So definitely the more recent translation. Yeah. Those are both really good. I'm actually doing a directed studies with Elizabeth Kincaid through the Neshota house next summer on women in the early 20th century. Mm. So it's going to be Stein and Unset and all of that. So yeah. I just, 
dig in. Yeah. But- also Gertrude von Lefort wrote yeah. the eternal woman, which is this like thin little book, but it's mm-hmm. super rich and interesting. Yeah. There's a lot of fun stuff going on in the early 20th century Well, you can um, with women writers. I haven't yeah. finished my reading list. So if you have ones that I need to put on there, I can also, I'll send you my reading list and you can like check it over and see what I Okay. Should do. <laughs> <laughs> well then I'll probably find things I haven't read either. So I can steal from your list. Yeah. Well, thank you for coming on today. I look forward yeah, to seeing see you Catholic Imagination Conference. In- yeah. Yay. In person. In wow. Person. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, well, thank you. Congratulations on your new job. Um, I look forward to seeing more stuff come out from you. So I really appreciate yeah. it. Every time you write something, every time you do something, I'm following. <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, ditto. All right. Okay. See ya. Right. Bye.